Father, we come before you, Lord, and we're just so grateful to be here today, Lord. We're so honored that we get to come into the house of God and to hear from you, not from a man, but Lord, we come to hear from you. And so we ask today that your Holy Spirit would teach us and lead us and guide us and direct us. Lord, show us in your word what you would have us to do through your ways, your will, and your desires for our life as we walk out of here today. God, I pray that we would be your church, Lord, that we would reflect your glory, that the world would look at us and they would not see us, but they would look at us and they would see you. And so, Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We ask that you'd bless the churches across the Inland Empire today that are meeting also. Churches like our Catholic brothers and sisters and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Messianic brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our denominational brothers and sisters like the Episcopalians and Methodists and Lutherans and Presbyterians. Lord, bless churches like Harvest and Sandals. Lord, we thank you for Water of Life. We ask that you bless Ecclesia and, and, and Emmanuel Baptist and Crossroads. Lord, we thank you for our Trinity. But we ask that you would bless each and every church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ because we never think of ourselves as better than anybody else. But Lord, we ask today that we would become your body, Lord, unified together for your purpose to spread and to share the love of Jesus Christ to this world so that they would come to know not us, but they would come to know you. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A couple of weeks ago, we started out a series uh, called Crossing the Red Sea. And, and as I started that series, Crossing the Red Sea, I asked this question, and everybody kind of answered that because we've all been there before. And the question I asked you was, have you ever had, or have you ever been at a place in your life where your back was against the wall? Yes, right? So we're going to transition from that question with the same mindset to now, this position in life where each and every one of us come to where our backs aren't against the wall, but now it seems like in life we are facing a wall in front of us, something that impedes our progress. I mean, think about life in general. There are all sorts of different scenarios and different situations in life in which we face walls. I mean, think about it. There are walls that you face in relationships. If you're married and you've ever been in a fight or an argument or you've ever been wrong in a relationship, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You try to make up and there is a wall in front of you. It, it may not be a physical wall, but you, it, it's, it's going to take a while for that wall to come down. We have walls in our relationships because of bitterness or because of hurt, because of offenses. We have walls in, in our emotions and the things that go on in our lives. Why? Because of there's, there's different circumstances and things that have happened to us. We face walls financially. It seems like every time you're doing good, it seems like everything's changing. Everything's starting to, you know, you're, you've gotten through that uphill battle and now it's all on the way down. And all of a sudden it's like, boom, a wall financially. You know, all the things that you had coming your way were... We're drying up and it's just like, what is going on? Walls in our health, right? Everything's going well and all of a sudden it just takes one doctor's visit, one diagnosis and it's like a, a, a wall right in front of us. Like, where am I going to go from here? We face walls all throughout the course of our lives. As a matter of fact, I think the biggest walls we face are the walls that we build in our own life, right? Right? We build walls of defense. We build walls to keep things out. We've been hurt. We've been injured. We've been wounded by people. And so what do we do? We build up walls, right? You, you hurt me once before. I'm not going to let it happen again. So I'm going to shut that off and I'm going to build up a wall. And I'm going to just be, you know, a uh, stone face, stone cold in my life and my thoughts. And we deal and we build these walls all the time. There's, there's not a question of if you face a wall in your life. The question is, when will you face a wall? And, and today, I want to tell you a story in the Bible and look at a story in the Bible of what the Bible talks about because, you know, walls are not something unfamiliar to God. And as we talk about the physical walls of Jericho, we're going to look at what that means to you and I and the walls of life that we will face and the things that we will come up, the obstacles that we come that seem like they're impenetrable, they're impassable, that it seems like there's no solution. It seems like forward progress is inhibited now because not my back is not against a wall. I'm trying to move forward, but it seems like I can't advance in that. And so we're looking at Hebrews, the 11th chapter. So in your Bibles, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 30, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 30, it says it like this. By faith, why? Because we're talking about faith. The whole subject of what we're discussing is faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. So here we look at the story of the Jericho. Now let me give you a little bit of a background if you're not familiar with the story of Jericho. We talked about the crossing of the Red Sea and Moses uh, and the exodus of Egypt. And we told the story of that and the plagues of Egypt. And now they walk through the Red Sea. This is not like two weeks later. This is 40 years later. 
You see, after the crossing of the Red Sea, the people of Israel, the Hebrews, they went into the wilderness and they had a couple of more different challenges that they were faced with. They had no water. They, they came up to a spring and the spring was bitter and they said, Moses, have you brought us out into the wilderness to die because there was not enough graves in Egypt? It's kind of like the same thing they said when they got to the Red Sea. Did you bring us out here to die because there's not enough graves in Egypt? So then they, the God miraculously turns the bitter spring into fresh water and provides for his people. They go out there and they say, God, we need food. So God provides provides food for them. They get to the promised land, and if you know the story, there they send out 12 spies into the promised land, the land in which we know now is modern-day Israel. And as the 12 spies go out, the Bible tells us they come back. I mean, think about this for a moment. We have Napa Valley in California, but they come back with clusters of grapes so big and so heavy that they had to have two men hold them together with a pole. They tied the clusters of grapes onto a pole, and they carried it with two men in. I mean, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. What is milk and honey? I don't know what that means, but um, I, I just like to think it's a land flowing of avocados and grapes, all right, because that's about all we need to survive. So, so they come back and they bring this. I mean, this is absolutely the best place. I mean, we've never seen anything like that, but there's a problem. There are people in this land already. It's not empty. What do we do? And not only are there people in this land, they're fierce warriors. And not only are they fierce warriors, they're giants. And so what happens? What do they do? Well, if you know the story, the Bible says that they begin to complain. And 10 of the 12 spies report back that we cannot take this land. It's, it's too great. They're too great of a people. And two people, Joshua and Caleb, try to like slap some sense into the children of Israel and say, are you guys serious? Are you kidding me? Did we not just see God defeat the greatest army on earth and then drown them in the Red Sea? Did we not just see God provide water for us out of a bitter spring? Did we not see God uh, lead us the entire way? Did we not see God provide food for us when we didn't have anything? And now you want to say we can't do this? But yet they didn't listen to reason. And you know, hindsight's 20-20, isn't it? Sometimes we get like that in our own lives, right? It's like it's so obvious the decision in front of us, but we're so wrapped up in what we see. We're so wrapped up in what we feel. We're so wrapped up in the, in the challenge that lies ahead that we can't see past that challenge. And this is exactly the situation that the children of Israel are in. So they decided they were not going to go into the promised land. And, and, and the Bible says that God was furious with them. I mean, he, he said, told Moses, Moses, I'm done. A parents, I love it. My wife says this all the time. She says, you know, with the kids, she's like, I'm done. I'm finished. I'm, it, that's it. It's done. And it's like, you're, you're done with what? Like, so God says to Moses, I'm done. I'm finished. Moses says, wait, 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 hold on. Um, if you kill everybody right now, Egypt's going to say about you that you couldn't do what you said you were going to do. And because you couldn't do it, you wiped them out. And you see, God wasn't responding to Moses. God was setting Moses up to show him what a true leader does to, to uh, come on behalf of his people, to be the advocate between God and his people. And so here Moses takes his position, he takes his place, and so God says, you know what, okay, because you said that, I'm not going to kill everybody. Whew, all right. But I'm going to make them wander in the desert for 40 years until they all die, and then the next generation will get the opportunity. Okay. So the story goes, 40 years later, Moses has just died, 120 years old. Joshua and Caleb are now, they're 80 years old, okay? Now that, there's another story in the Bible. If you think, well, you know, I got to do something for God when I'm young, and I'm, I'm at the end of my days, it's the sunset years of my life, and, and I can't do anything for God. I think Moses trumps that, I think Joshua trumps that, and I think Caleb trumps that. Caleb was 80 years old, he'll come in and he says, that's my mountain, I'm taking it, and I feel better today at 80 than I do at 40. Because God will give you the grace to serve him. That's for another day, another message. That was free. So, it's, it, it's 40 years later, and now Joshua is the leader of the people of Israel. The Bible says that they come to Joshua and they say, like Moses, you are the representative of God to us. We will serve you. We will listen to you. We will do what you tell us to do. God speaks to you and to you only, and God speaks to you, and you tell us what to do, and we'll do it. We, they pledge their loyalty to Joshua, and, jo and God says to Joshua, Joshua, it's time. Moses is gone, the generation has passed, it is time. So the story goes is that they're standing there at the banks of the Jordan River, and God says to, Mo to Joshua, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant with your priests, and I want you to start to have them walk through the Jordan River. And as they begin, and they carry the Ark of the Covenant, and they're carrying it, you know, that Indiana Jones thing that you saw in Indiana Jones, as they're carrying that Indiana Jones thing, the Ark of the Covenant, they step into the Jordan River, and all of a sudden, the waters recede. 
The waters flow down, downstream and upstream. They begin to collect and they begin to hold on their own. And now the Bible says that they cross through on dry. And it says firm ground, not like Pastor Dan talked about, not muddy ground. They, they pass through on dry ground. So once again, it's an amazing crossing. And here it's a crossing in victory because now they're coming from a position of, of wilderness now to a position of inhabitants. And it's now to come home. And so God brings them through the Jordan River on dry ground. It's a high point. Joshua says, I want everybody to set up. I want one person from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. I want each one of them to grab a stone out of the river where we cross, sling it up over your shoulder. And where we camp tonight, I want you to lay them out. And this is going to be a memorial that we cross through the Jordan River by the hand of God on dry ground. I mean, it was an absolute high moment in the lives of the children of Israel. Here they are coming into the land. And God has laid, the, like literally rolled out the red carpet through the, through the Jordan River. Now, we're not talking about the Jordan Creek, right? Okay, this is the Jordan River, and it says it was harvest time, so it means that this was a big river. Think like Mississippi in flood stage. This is what they're walking across, and God literally receded the waters, and so he rolls out the red carpet for them, and they cross, cross through. Don't you know that whenever there's a high moment in life, Whenever there's like that, that summit, like you've made it, you finally arrived, you feel that the heavens are shining down upon you and you're like, ah, right, right? Don't you know right after that, like as you get over the hill, you start to see that little opposition. It's like coming over Kellogg Hill on the 10 freeway. You, you kind of get a view of Los Angeles, maybe potentially on a good day, if there's not any smog, you can see the high-rise buildings of Los Angeles. And they begin, as they come over, they begin to see the walls of Jericho. And Jericho was known. Jericho was renowned for its walls, these impenetrable walls that were, that were, that were many, many, many feet thick. I mean, trebuchets and catapults and those things hadn't even yet arrived on the scene with science. And so here they look at this opposition, they look at the city, they look at this fortified place, and they have a wall literally in front of them. In order to progress, they have to make it through Jericho. You see, the very important thing to understand about this is that because this is 40 years later, we can look back on hindsight and we can see that the previous generation chose to withdraw from this fight, from this advance, from this decision that God was leading them in. But the current generation, Joshua's generation, chose to advance. You see, you're going to come up against walls in your life. You're going to come up against hardships. You're going to come up against roadblocks. There's going to be things, whether you build these walls in your life or you're coming up against a wall physically or emotionally or spiritually or, or relationally, relationally or financially, there are going to be walls in your life. And like the children of Israel, you're going to have a choice with every hardship that comes your way, with every challenge, with every fight, with every battle. Are you going to withdraw from the argument, from the fight, from the battle, from the challenge? Or are you going to advance through it and trust in God? And this is a lesson here. We see that the first generation, they chose to withdraw. But Joshua's generation said, no, we're going forward. We crossed the Jordan. We're not going back. We're taking Jericho. And so as the story goes, there Joshua's there. And, and the Bible says that the commander of the armies of the Lord holding a sword stands before Joshua. Now this is not an angel. It says that the capital C commander, and it says when he speaks capital H to Joshua, he, he says to Joshua, Joshua says, whoa, you know, who are you? He says, are you a friend or are you a foe? Are you coming for me or are you coming against me? And he says, I'm neither. He says, the question is, whose side are you on? He tells Joshua, Joshua, take your feet off. You're on holy ground. I mean, Joshua's standing in front of Jesus right now. And so here he tells Joshua, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to tell you. So he lays it out. He gives Joshua this whole plan about how to take Jericho, these impenetrable walls. And, in, and in, uh, if you've got your Bibles, go with me because I want to just take you to a couple of verses. Go with me to the book of, of Joshua in the sixth chapter. Joshua chapter 6. And we see that this is a lesson of faith. And we'll see why this is a lesson of faith. Because the way that the walls of Jericho were torn down were not of anything of their own abilities, but rather of God. So chapter 5, the commander of the army of the Lord comes and visits Joshua. In chapter 6, verse number 1, it says it like this. Now Jericho was securely shut up. Because of the children of Israel. Now I've got that highlighted, highlighted on the screens. Securely shut up. They were locked up. So that no one went out and no one came in. 
And then look at verse number two. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and the mighty men of valor. Okay, play with me for a minute. Look what it says in verse number one. It says, now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel, so that no one came in and no one went out. They locked the gates. They went inside the city. There was no way in. There was no way out, okay? But then verse number two says, the Lord says to Joshua, Joshua, see, I have given you Jericho. Wait, 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 okay. Verse number one said that Jericho was securely shut up so that nobody came in and nobody went out. But then the very next verse, God says to Joshua, see? Joshua's like, um, no, I don't see. I, I see a locked gate. I see a really big wall. I see archers on ramparts. I, I, I don't see it. But God says, Joshua, I have given to you Jericho. You see, what we have to understand when it comes to walls that we face, when it comes to the walls that we build, that we need to tear down so that God can do something in our life, God will always see the victory long before we'll ever see it. And so there, they're standing in front of an impenetrable city. They're walking in faith, and God says to Joshua, he's like, I see it. Don't you see it? And Joshua's like, no. But God will always see your victory before you see it. God will always see your victory before you see it. You see, there's a set time in your life. If you're up against a wall right now, if you're trying to make progress, if something happened that's stopping you in your tracks, there is a set time that God will take you through that wall, that he will tear down those walls. Is if you've been building up those walls because of things that have happened to you, and you say to yourself, man, I really don't want to be this way. I'm tired of the way I am. I know this is not how God wants me to be. I believe with all of my heart that there is a set time that God has a victory where those walls are going to come crashing down. And God says, I see it well before you You'll ever see it. The question is, are you going to trust me and walk in it? You see, the story of the walls of Jericho is a classic example of God's hand and the feet of his people working in conjunction together. You see, God's sovereignty compared with uh, uh, or paired with human responsibility was the formula for the, the walls of Jericho to come down. It was not on their own. It was not on their own power. It was not because they could build catapults or ramparts. It was not because they could build those big, you know, uh, siege towers like you see in like Lord of the Rings and they had all that. It wasn't because of that. It was because God was sovereign and said, I've got a plan. And because I've got a plan, I want you to walk in my plan. So they said, God, we'll trust in your plan and we'll do what you want us to do, even though we don't see what you're asking us to do. We'll do it anyways. So the story goes, of course, we know, or if you don't know, I'll tell you right now. The story goes that God tells them, I want you to walk around the city of Jericho one time every day in complete silence. I want you to take the priests and the Ark of the Covenant, and I want you to walk, lead them in the front of the army, and I want everybody to encircle the city one time every day. I don't want you to say anything. I don't want you to have any words. I don't want you to do anything. He says, I want you to do that. And then on the seventh day, now see, I'm just, he says, I'm just warming you up for the exercise, all right? You're just stretching. On the seventh day, I want you to walk through around Jericho seven times in one day. And on the seventh time, on the seventh day, I will tell you, and I want everybody in the army to shout out a shout of victory, and then the walls will come down. And God says, when the walls come down, then you go in and you take the city, and it's yours your place, your home. This is now what I have promised you. God says, I want you to do that. And so you see, it's kind of an odd thing to walk in complete silence, to, to encircle a city and not say anything. And there's the, the priests as they carry the trumpets and, or as they carry the ark and they're blowing their shofar, the ram's horn, the trumpet. And there they are and they're doing that one day after the next. I mean, can you imagine the ridicule from the ramparts of the wall? What are these guys doing? Like, okay, okay, first day, day one, they're like, you know, Jericho, the Bible says that their hearts melted because they knew that what they had heard what God was doing. So day one, they're like, oh, they're here. Oh, my goodness. And then they walk around in silence. And then day two, wait, they did that yesterday. Day three, wait, 
what are these guys doing? Day four, you guys are stupid. Day five, you're not getting in. Day six, what are you thinking you're doing? Just say something. Day seven, man, these guys are really just trying to get their work out. Is this like a 5K right now? What are they? And then all of a sudden, it happens. You see, it's a faith walk. It's a test of our faith with God's sovereignty paired with human victory. You see, it's really easy to celebrate when you see the victory. But can you celebrate and cry out a shout of victory when you don't even see it coming? Because that's exactly what God was asking his people to do. A couple of years ago, when the Ontario rain had first come uh, to Ontario, we went to a hockey game. It was real cool. You know, like we got like $12.50 tickets, and, and we were all there with our, our friends and some of our family members, and, and, and they were doing pretty good. But at the, at the end of the game, about 10 minutes after the game or into the game, about five minutes left in the game, they were down by about, I think, two points. And, and in that game, they were down about two points. And, and if you've ever been to a, a sporting event when the home team is down and the clock is winding down and it doesn't look like there's any hope, what, what does everybody start doing? They start leaving, right? They look at it they say, you know, they lost. You know, and they look at their watch, like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to try to beat the traffic. I'm going to get out before the rush. You know, and I've got to use the bathroom before. And so, so they go. So all of our friends and some of our family members, they were there and they left and they were like, well, you know, they lost. We're going to go. We're going to try to get out of here before the traffic goes. And we're like, okay, cool. See you guys later. You know, I'm El Cheapo. So I wanted to get all $12.50 that I paid for that ticket <laughs> worth. So we stayed. Well, in hockey, there's a strategy where if the team is down, there's not really much to lose. You're already going to lose anyways. What they do is they end up pulling the goalie out of that net. And in, in the place of the goalie, they put another offender onto the ice. So you've got four offenders trying to score a goal on one goalie. And so you've got a man-up advantage on that. And so they, everybody left, and they pulled the goalie. And all of a sudden, boom, they scored a goal. And it's like, oh, the crowd starts cheering. Everybody's going crazy. Now they're down by one. There's like 12 seconds left in the game, and everybody's up on their feet. The goalie's out, and they're, they're passing it around. And they're passing around. Sure enough, boom, they score a goal. The crowd goes nuts, right? Everybody's just cheering. And then it's overtime. So now they got to go to sudden death overtime. And what happens? Boom, they score another goal. And they come back with five minutes left in the game from down from two to win the game. Just so happens at that moment when everybody's screaming and everybody's cheering, they're like, did you see that? I get a text on my phone. Hey, we're in the parking lot. What's going on? We can hear all the screaming from inside. I'm like, they won! You see, it's really easy to cheer for the sports team when they're winning. But when they're losing, only the dedicated fans like me are the ones that cheer. It's the same thing when it comes to hardships and walls and trials that we face. It's really easy when we can see the victory. But when God says, I just want you to walk around the wall once, for, uh, once a day, and I don't want you to say anything. I don't want you to worry about your, your, your catapults, and I don't want you to worry about setting the city on fire. I don't want you, just walk. You're like, wait a minute. God says to you, hey, don't you see? I've given you a future. I've given you life. Don't you see? I've come that you would have it more abundantly. Don't you see? And you're like, no, I don't see. Can you trust in God? enough to celebrate and to shout and to cry a cry of victory when you can't see the victory in front of you because God will always see your victory before you'll ever see it and God knows at the set time when it's coming your way it's a faith thing it's a trust thing and that's why there's verses in the Bible that we don't like what Verses in the Bible that we don't like. Verses such as James, the first chapter, right? It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I don't like that verse because I don't want to count it a joy. I, I want to complain. I want to gripe. I want to, I want to tell the world of my sorrows. You know, it's, it's, it's just human nature. Marketing statistics tell us that somebody who has a negative experience with a business will tell 11 people about that negative experience. As compared to somebody who has a positive experience with the business, they'll tell two. We like to complain. 
And here James says, brethren, count it all joy when you run up against a wall. When you come up to the Jericho of your life or you have built Jericho and you are stuck inside wanting to get out, desiring to be something different. He says, count it at all joy. Why does he say that? Because he says this. He says, knowing. Why? Because God sees the victory ahead of you. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It's a trust thing. It's a faith thing. That's why in Hebrews it says, by faith the walls of Jericho came down, fell down flat as they encircled the city. Why? Because they trusted God even when they didn't see the results. They said, God, you said it. That settles it. I believe it. I'm going to do it. Will you trust God when you don't see the answer? That is the question for you and I. And it goes back to the very decision that the children of Israel had to make 40 years earlier. When they could not see the victory at that time in their life, they could not yet trust God. And what happened? They were led into the wilderness to wander until the opportunity came again. When you're faced with a wall, when you're faced with a trial, when you're faced with a battle, you will have the decision, am I going to advance or am I going to withdraw? Am I going to stand in God's sovereignty and walk in my responsibility? Or am I going to withdraw and try to take the responsibility upon myself? It is all about faith. And that's why Hebrews 11 chapter verse number 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. Why? Because God says, I want you to trust me. Trust me in this. So here, practicality, God tells Joshua some amazing things. And in our lives, as we face a wall, we understand that we have a decision to make in that wall, in that trial, in that fight. We have a choice to advance or to withdraw. We have a choice to make, am I going to stand in God's sovereignty and walk in my responsibility? And am I going to trust that God sees the victory even when I don't? And if I do all of those things, what do I do? That's what God tells Joshua to do. He says it like this, you're in Joshua, the 6th chapter. Joshua, the 6th chapter, verse number 10. It says this, Joshua, the 6th chapter, verse number 10. Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth. Listen to this, listen to this. Until the day I say to you, shout, and then you shall shout. Joshua says, I don't, not just when you walk, I, Joshua says, don't say anything. We are taking a pledge of silence for six days. And then on the seventh day, we're going to take a pledge of silence for half of that day. God says to Joshua, I want you to tell the people, don't do anything. I don't want a peep to come out of their mouth. I don't want a word to come out of their mouth. I don't want a question to come out of their mouth. I want them to walk in complete silence. Why did God say that? Because when we look at the people of Israel, when we look at the Hebrews as they cross from day one, from the moment Moses showed up to Egypt, from the Red Sea to the springs, to the wilderness, to the boundaries of the, of the promised land, back to the wilderness, all the way through the entire time Moses existed on earth, they complained. They complained. They spoke out. They questioned. They said, well, what, who's this guy? Who's Moses that we should even follow him? Who, what, what, what gives Moses the right? Moses, have you led us here to die? Oh, God didn't want us. God, God has cursed us. And every time something happened, God said to them, all you guys do is complain. So he says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make you do the silent treatment. Have you ever tried to not talk for like an hour I'm, I think my family, Stacey and I are both naturally introverted people. And so because of that, it's not hard to not talk. But when you're trying specifically to give the silent treatment, you're mad and you're like, I'm not talking. I'm not talking. And somebody's like, what do you think? <laughs> what, you're not going to talk to me right now? <laughs> After about like five minutes, you're like inside, you're like, oh, come on, come on, say something. It just builds up, right? I mean, can you imagine seven days of complete silence? Some of you are like, amen. <laughs> that would be a vacation. 
You see, God says to his people, keep quiet and trust me. When you're up against the wall, when you're going through a fight, when you're going through a battle, what do you do? Keep quiet and trust God. Keep quiet and trust God. Because you see, just like the people of Israel, we have a tendency to want to voice out. We have a tendency to want to complain. We have a tendency to want to let people know how we feel. As a matter of fact, have you ever heard the phrase, misery loves company? I mean, as evidenced by, take a 30-second stroll on your Facebook timeline and you will see that people want the world to know how bad their life is right now. And so God says, when you're up against a wall, when you're in a trial, when there's not a solution ahead of you, when it looks like you're at the walls of Jericho and they're impenetrable, when you're trapped on the inside because you've built these walls that now you can't even get out of, God says, well, I want you to do something. I want you to keep quiet and trust me. Stop complaining. Stop griping. Stop telling the world about your sorrow and your misery and trust me. You see, there's a difference. we got to understand this. Because I'm not telling you to keep it all into yourself. Because there is a very stark difference between spewing your problems and sharing them. The Bible says to bear one another's burdens. And so I'm not saying, well, don't tell anybody your problems. But what we like to do is we like to spew them. We like to tell the whole world, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. You know, there's a, there's a difference between confiding in somebody and consulting with somebody. And we like to do that. God says something. We read the word of God and we say, man, I just feel like God spoke to me. So what do we do? Instead of saying, God, did you speak to me? What do we do? We pick up the phone. Hey, you know what? I was thinking this, 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 and this, and this. And all of a sudden I felt like God spoke to me. Do you think God spoke to me? Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. And you, go, you and get a committee together, right? Let's all have dinner. Let's go to a picnic and let's just hang out or whatever. I just wanted to run it past you the board of directors of my life. I feel like God was telling me something and I just wanted to know, do you think it was God that was telling me? And they're like, wait a minute, you said, God said to, to not say anything and walk around Jericho for six days? Uh, no, that's not God. You should be making catapults for your wall. And so we consult and we consult and consult until we find the answer that best fits within our comfort zone. And then we say, oh, that must have been God. When God says, no, I want you to keep quiet and trust in me. There's a story where Elisha the prophet comes to a Shunammite woman and he promises her a son. Sure enough, nine months later, boom, she has a baby boy. Twelve years later, he's in the field and he has a brain hemorrhage and he dies in her lap. So she goes to Elisha where he's at and as she's walking, she's walking briskly. She's getting there. Elisha sees her coming and he sends his servant Gehazi and he says, man, she's, something's coming. The Lord didn't tell me why she's coming. Go meet her and ask her what it is. So Gehazi runs down to meet her. And he says, what's going on? Are, is everything okay? What does she say to Gehazi? She says this. She says, it is well. No, it's not. Your son is at home dead. It is not well. But you see, she was not trying to spew her problems to the whole world. She says, no, I'm going to confide in Elisha. I'm going to go and I'm going to share with Elisha. You promised me a kid and that kid just died. And Elisha, I need you to do something about it. The Bible says in Psalms, the 46th chapter, it says it like this. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. I will be exalted among the nations. That is really hard to do. That's one of those verses, like James chapter 1. Why is it hard? Because at 3 o'clock in the morning, when you know tomorrow you're coming up against the wall, what's going on? Your mind is like, right? Going through every scenario. What if they say this? What if they say that? If they say that, I'm going to say this. And if they say that, then they're going to say this. And if they say that, I'm going to say this. And, and I've got it all planned out. And I'm, I'm going to work it out. And I'm going I'm to do it. And God says, stop. Keep quiet. Shut out the voices of your thoughts. Shut out the voices of the outside world. Listen to my voice and I will lead you because I've got a set time for your victory. Let God's sovereignty guide your responsibility. That's just another way of saying faith and works. Let God, let your faith in God and his word guide your actions. Let God's sovereignty, Joshua, I have given you this city. Lord, that's all you needed to say for me to say, okay. You had me at Joshua. 
Let God's sovereignty guide your responsibility. You see, because before every major victory, there's always a major battle. And God knows the set time of your life. Maybe you're in that major battle right now. Maybe you've been in that major battle for months, for weeks, for years. And you're saying, I'm getting tired. I'm getting weary. I don't know what to do. God says, listen, I have a set time in your life where you will see the victory. You see, God told Joshua, I got a set time. The set time is seven days on the seventh day after the seventh time. That's when your set time is. And then you act in what I said to do and it will happen. Let God's sovereignty guide your responsibility. Joshua in the sixth chapter, we're still there. Verse number 20. It says, so the people... They've walked around. This is their seventh time on the seventh day. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. You see, Jericho represented a new season for the people of Israel. They were no longer outcasts. They were no longer outsiders. They were no longer nomads. They were no longer wanderers in the desert. This was a new season in their life. They were coming from the outside to now the inside. They were coming from wandering to their home. They were coming from a people of no position to a people of position. They were coming to a people of no nation to establishing a nation. uh, Jericho represented the beginning of a new season in their life. God has a new season in store for you. And the wall that you may be facing now, the wall that you may be up against now, the wall that you might come up against in the future represents to you a new season that God is going to take you through. A people, he said, who once had no God, now a people who have a God. A people who had no hope, now to a people who have a hope. A people who had no position, to a people who have position. A people who had no authority, to people who have authority. God is going to bring you into a new season in your life. The walls that you are facing at God's set time in your life are going to fall down flat, not by your resilience, not by your effort, not by your pride, not by anything you can do, but because of God's sovereignty in your life and your responsibility to walk in God's sovereignty because God sees the victory long before you ever will. There is a new season headed your way. In, in, the, in the name of Jesus, I believe that. In the book of Hebrews, in the 10th chapter, and I'll finish with this. Hebrews, in the 10th chapter, verse number 32, it says, But recall, in the former days, back in the days, he says, You, after where you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle and strivings. Look what it says. But, but uh, partly while you were, verse number 33, partly while you were made a spectacle, You felt weird. You felt a little dumb. It didn't make any sense what God said to you. It just didn't seem to fit with logic like walking around the walls of Jericho while the people behind the walls are saying, what are you doing? He says, you were made a spectacle because of me, because of your associations with me. For you had compassion on me and my chains, the the author says. Verse number 35, it says, jump to verse number 35 because we just need to get to there and we'll be done. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Why? Verse number 36. For you are in need of endurance, so that after you have endured the will of God, you may receive the promise. The new season, the new era, the coming from the outside to being on the inside, from being locked up on the inside of the walls that you have built to the freedom of leaving the prisons that you have built for yourself. God says, I've got a plan, I've got a time. You may not see it, but I see it. Will you trust God enough to walk in the victory that God sees over your life when you don't see it? Like the sports fan that celebrates their team even when they don't see victory, they know there's something. There's always tomorrow. There's always next week. There's always next season. God has a point in your life. 
He's going to take you through the walls. He's not asking you to climb the walls. He's going to remove the walls, tear them down with his sovereignty so that your responsibility can be to walk through them. Today, as a church, God wants to take his people to a new place. And his people, he's not going to do anything that you can do yourself. He didn't beam the children of Israel across the Red Sea. He had them walk through it. So you look at that wall and you say, why, oh God, am I in front of this wall? And God says, because I want you to trust me. Because I'm going to tear that wall down in your life. And I'm going to bring you into a new season. I'm going to bring you into a new identity. I'm going to make you a completely new person with my sovereignty. All I'm asking you to do is to walk in your responsibility and trust in my sovereignty. Let your faith guide your feet. And let God take you to that new season and tearing down those walls in your life. Did you, get, did you guys get something out of the word today? Amen. Praise God. Well, hey, listen, before we leave, we've got a couple of minutes. Don't get up. Don't leave yet. Church isn't out. Let me do something really quick. I want to just take a quick moment to examine our hearts into our lives and just to talk to you really quickly about the eternal state of your position with God. You see, the Bible says that eternity is set in the hearts of men. We think about it. We oftentimes ponder what happens to us after we die. What, 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 what comes of my life after this, after this period of my life exists or ends? What is there? And the Bible says that there's heaven or hell. The question I want you to ask yourselves is, if you were to leave today and you were to die, I, hope, I pray to God that's not the case, but would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? You see, the way that you come about that conclusion or how you arrive at that answer has a lot to say about your position and your place with God. So today I want to look at your answers. I want to look at those and let's examine ourselves. The Bible says that we ought to examine our hearts from time to time. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you want to get to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you hope to get to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you desire that you want to get to heaven, that you're going to get there, that God's going to look at you and say, man, they wanted it bad enough, I'm going to give it to them. You can't find that in God's Word. You see, nowhere in God's Word does it say that because you go to church, because you attend on a regular or semi-regular basis, because you, you call yourself a Christian, because you've given yourself a title, because when the census came knocking on your door, you checked off the mark, Christian, your parents told you that you were a Christian growing up. You've got a cross around your neck or, or, or like many people now in our society, you've got a tattoo or a, a, a something on your body that references God or scripture. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church on a regular, semi-regular basis? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you growing up that you were a Christian and you went to catechism or Sunday school classes. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you made a one-time promise. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you, 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 you go to church or because you're a good person. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you uh, sometimes pray a prayer that you're going to get into heaven. You, you see, you can't find that in the Word of God. Oftentimes what happens is we think, well, you know what, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I have a heightened sense of spirituality. I know that there are things in the world that are, that are at work that are greater than I or that I can't see that I'm not in control of. And, and I don't want to, like, land on anything. I don't want to make the wrong decision or I don't want to. So I just believe that we're all spiritual beings and we'll all find that, that spiritual place wherever it is that we're destined to go. But did you know that there's nowhere in the Bible that says that you can just kind of hope or think or wish or want, that you can desire, you can be a spiritual person, that you can even be a good person? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought good people. Go to heaven. Do you know that the Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags? See, nothing you could do on your own would ever make you good enough to get into heaven. Why? Because God's not after just your actions. He's not after what you do on the outside. He's not after your charitable contributions or the fact that you stand for social activism. There's so much more that God wants. Why? Because he sent Jesus. And that's the fundamental difference between what we say and where everybody else says is we are the only ones. Jesus is the only one who died for our sins when he was innocent. To take the burden of sin of humanity and take it upon himself and take that position for us. And thus Jesus says it like this, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He says no one goes to the Father, heaven, except through me. You see, you can't do it your way, some well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way you and I can do it is God's way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus says it like this in the book of John in the third chapter. John in the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a man by the name of Nicodemus and he says, in order to see the kingdom of God, remember God sees it before we see it. He says, in order to see the kingdom of God, for your eyes to be open to it, you must be born again. What does that mean, born again? Well, it's not what Hollywood and society and cultures made it out to be. It's not that weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. Born again from the beginning of God's word. 
to the end of God's word has always meant the same thing in the heart and in the eyes of God. What is it? It means that you've given God all of your heart. It means that you've given God all of your life through his son, Jesus Christ. Let me show it to you in the Bible. The book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to his church, people like you and me. And he says, listen, I'm coming back, I'm returning. And when I come back, I'd rather find that you're hot, he says, I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, because if I find that you're lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's a shocking statement, crude and rude. It was an eye-opener to the church to say, stop trying to do it your way. I'm coming back, and I better find that you're in the right position, because if you think that you're okay, if you think that it's about ceremonial ritual, if you think it's about occasional church attendance, if you think it's about doing a little bit of my thing and a little bit of your thing and riding the fence, he says, listen, I'm, you're not going to make it. I'm going to reject you, expel you from the kingdom of God. That doesn't have to be your future. That doesn't have to be your destiny. That doesn't have to be your plan. And in that same conversation, Jesus says it like this. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, whoever opens the door, I will come in and I will dine with him and he will dine with me. He says, we will be in relationship together. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to just take you or, or pull you out. He said, well, if God wants me, he can take me. God wanted you so much, he gave everything he had. Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die on a cross from our sin and our shame so that we could in turn accept the invitation, the knocking on the door of our heart to say, I will respond to Jesus. Jesus says it like this. He says, no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. And I believe right now in this place, all over this auditorium, even at home on the live stream, wherever you're at, I believe right now that the Spirit of God is knocking on your heart, saying, I want a relationship with you. I want life with you. I want a future with you. And now the decision, the invitation is at your doorstep, at the doorstep of your heart. Will you accept that invitation? Today I want to give you the opportunity to do that. You see, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that it's the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. Like any gift, you have a choice. Like anybody knocking on your door, you have a choice. Are you going to ignore it or are you going to open it? Are you going to receive it or are you going to reject it? Today I want to give you the opportunity to accept that gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And here's what I'm going to do. Jesus says it like this. He says that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his Father. He says, but if you deny him, he will deny you. In just a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands together real loud, just like that. And when I do that, I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You see, what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what? I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I feel that knocking on the door of my heart, and I want to respond. You see, what we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer together of salvation. And if that's you in this place, you say, I, I want to be included in that prayer. I want to I change my life. I want to give my heart, my life to Jesus Christ. Well, but Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, I think I'm going to be embarrassed. Listen, I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm not here to single you out or to ridicule you. My whole purpose in life is to build you up in the ways of God. And this is the very first step in that human responsibility of walking in God's sovereignty. By making the decision to follow Jesus. Who should raise your hands if you've never given him your heart, if you've never given your life? To Jesus Christ, if that's you in just a moment, get ready, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. If you're not sure, maybe you did this as a child in the youth group, you went to a crusade once before, but you've never really followed through, or you just never, you're not sure. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is God's seal of approval on you. God does not want you walking through life wondering and hoping that you're okay with him. He says, I've given you the Spirit of God to know that you are right with me. Today, don't walk out of this place without making sure of your position with God. If you've been li living lukewarm, what does that mean? Running from God instead of to God. Doing some of your own thing instead of God's thing. You've been playing Sunday church. Doing the church thing on Sunday. The rest of the week, you're doing your own thing. Listen, if you've been living lukewarm, this is your moment. This is your time to change that destiny forever. Right here, right now. And to accept the life of Jesus Christ. I'm going to count to three. And when I do hands all over this auditorium, from the front row to the back row, from the sides to sides. The guys in the family rooms, I can see you through the windows, wherever you're at. If you're around the campus watching by television, wherever you're at. This is your moment. This is your time. When I count to three, if that's you, you pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. And we'll go forward together from there in your eternal destiny with Jesus Christ. But it starts today by making that decision. So I'm going to count to three. If that's you in this place, this is your divine appointment. You see, you've had doctors and dentist appointments now. It's a divine appointment between you and God. And now it's time for you to respond to that invitation that Jesus is knocking on your heart saying, come on, it's time for life. It's time for a new purpose. It's time for a new season. Are you going to respond? Today, I believe there are those of you in this place today that you need to respond. And this is your opportunity. I'm going to count to three. And when I do it, that's you. Pop your hand up. You ready? Here we go. One, two, 
three. Let me see your hands in this place today. If that's you in this place, one, two, I see those hands. Three, I see that hand. Four, I see the hand over there. I see the ushers pointing back over there. Four, five back there. Okay, I see you. Five wise people. Anybody else in this place today? On this side. Anybody over here on this side? Say amen. I wonder if I should. Yeah, you should. It's your time. It's your season. Anybody else today? Five wise people. Only, only right here? Y'all are good? Spirit of God speaking. You say, come on, this is your moment. This is your time. Five wise people. I see you right there, my man. Anybody else in this place? You say, yep, that's me. I feel like the Spirit of God's knocking on my heart. Come on, respond. Open that door and accept life through Jesus Christ. Anybody else in this place today? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Well, let's give the Lord a great big shout to five, six wise people. It's great. Here's what we're going to do. All five, six of you, maybe you're number seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, that you didn't raise your hand and you think to yourself, man, I missed it again. Listen, you didn't miss it. I said we're going to pray a prayer. Now it's time to follow up with that decision. Listen, you and I know this together. Any decision without action is no decision at all. You can decide to do anything and not do anything about it, and it'll never happen. So now you're deciding, I want to give Jesus my heart. I want to give Jesus my life. Now we're going to pray that prayer together. We're going to do it together. We're going to change destinies together. So if that's you in this place and you raised your hand, or maybe you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Look to somebody and say, come on, will you go with me? Or if they, they're next to you and they raise their hand, say, come on, I'll go with you. Let's go together. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chairs. Everybody stands and come meet me here at this aisle or at this altar. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. So if that's you in this place from the front, from the back, wherever you're at, you come. Meet me here today. This is your moment. That's you, come on. This is your moment. They're still coming, we'll wait for you. You can come too, come on. Praise God. Hey guys, you came. And somebody, maybe nobody's ever told you this before in your life, but somebody needs to tell you, good job. Good job. You're making a great decision. The best decision you can possibly make. You're starting off the right way. You say, well, you don't even know where I've come from. It doesn't matter because now your whole future is going to be different. Because it's not about where you came from. It's about where you're going. You're, you're headed for heaven, following Jesus. A whole new life is headed your way. I said we were going to pray with you, so here's what I'm going to do. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. I saw him on that video announcement. He's on the TV screen. He's famous. <laughs> He's going to take you guys just right over there. Nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets, and you have made it through me, all right? Here's what he's going to do. He's going to lead you in that prayer, okay? You're going to pray. What does that mean? You're going to invite Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Lord and Savior, what does that mean? You're going to invite him to be the leader of your life. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information. You're going to walk out of here and say, what do I do next? We're going to help point you in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. We want you to come back and hang out with us. We want to connect you with a friend, somebody here at the church. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You know you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. We, have, we call them spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you at our cafe. They'll buy you a cup of coffee or a soda, some french fries. They'll sit down with you for a couple of weeks, teach you some things about the word of God to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything God has for you. And so if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with my friend, Pastor Joel. Amen.